not according to the Word of God, not according to the Christian religion. Our morning prayer Tuesday collect says it clearly and succinctly, quote, O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Doing what you want is not necessarily the good life. It may not be life at all. And having it your way does not lead to freedom. Our choices, apart from God, are not true, don't promote life, and can't offer true freedom. Knowing God is the only source of life, and serving God is the only path to freedom. Outside of Him, we are bound to <clears throat> sin and death. It is inevitable. From the very beginning, from the Garden of Eden, the original garden, mankind was, has been tempted to ignore God and to follow one's own worldview. Satan deceived Adam and Eve into thinking that by going their own way, they would in fact not die, but would instead become like God. They were convinced to follow their own desires and establish their own standards of good and evil. They chose to direct their own affairs by personal choice alone. It did not lead to life. It did not lead to freedom. In our Old Testament passage, Jeremiah the prophet admonished the shepherds of Israel, prophets, priests, and kings, to care for the sheep of Israel. Instead, these leaders were leading the sheep astray away from God and abandoning them to their own devices. And that's the worst possible place for a sheep to be on its own. <coughs> the Lord warned these false teachers, these false leaders, that because they had failed to attend to God's sheep, God himself would attend to them for their evil deeds. But he promised the sheep that a shepherd would one day come, a king like David, who would rule with justice and righteousness, and all of God's people would be cared for and saved. People to this day continue to lead others away from God. People continue to buy into Satan's original lie that our own world can satisfy, our own worldview can satisfy. People continue to believe that going one's own way is the way of life and freedom and happiness and joy. But it isn't. Our gospel text makes clear that God's ways are not our ways. As Jesus hung there on the cross, the rulers and the soldiers, we are told, scoffed at Jesus, mocking him on the cross, saying, if you really are the king of kings, you should be able to come down from that cross and save yourself. That's what we would do. But their worldview was not God's worldview. They believed that life could only be had by not dying. What they failed to grasp, what they refused to believe, is that fallen human life is hopeless. Death for fallen humanity is inevitable. It is written into our DNA now. There is no other possibility. It is an appointment that has been made for all of us. 
And our worldview cannot change this. And this death is of far greater consequence than mere cessation of physical life. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. This is why the prophets in the Old Testament and Jesus, particularly in the New Testament, had much to say about leading others astray from God. They knew <coughs> it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God, as the writer to the Hebrews puts it. And it's an even more terrible thing to lead others there, Jesus would say. Thank the Lord that God's way is not our way. Jesus was about to die on the cross that day. And even the criminals crucified with him were annoyed at him. At least one of them was. But Jesus assured the other one, we're going to die here today, you and me and your <coughs> friends. But know this, that today you will be with me in paradise. You see, God's way is life through death. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And as Peter says, to give his life, or as Mark says, to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, the world will tell you that the measure of life is found within yourself. By being true to yourself, authentic. It's the same lie that Adam and Eve believed, believing that they could set their own standards. Well, we've fallen short, not only of our own standards, but more importantly, those of God. And in so doing, we have forfeited life. The only way to have life in this age and in the age to come is through the life and death of another, Jesus Christ, God's own Son. He was without sin, unlike us, and yet he chose to pay for ours. And then he rose victorious as proof that it was done. And so life is found in knowing God through Jesus Christ. And freedom is experienced in service to God alone. I think our colleague for today says it well. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your <coughs> way, beloved Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be free and brought together under his most gracious rule. The only way for it to happen. Who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. So as we consider, as Marjorie reminded us, as we consider our stewardship for this next year, let us remember that it is not our will, but God's that counts. And it is his will that we show forth our praise, show forth his praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives. By giving up ourselves to his service and by walking before him in holiness and righteousness all our days. Your giving supports the life and work of this place, this building, this church. God has blessed us with a beautiful facility in which to gather, to worship and learn, and to fellowship. And I trust that this campus and we who worship here are and will be to the glory of God. 
Your giving supports the expenses of this place, the buildings and the grounds. Your giving supports the ministry that happens here, and it supports our ministry that reaches other people and other places as well. As you've been told, we base our budget on what you give, on pledging, promises, and you have been faithful stewards in that regard. <clears throat> And you are even more generous in giving beyond those general needs when asked to do so to meet other needs. It's a beautiful thing to behold. And so I close with two, three things to guide us that Jesus and Paul uh, mentioned in their own ways. One, our giving is to be intentional make it a part of your spending habit think about it pray about it make plans advance in advance to give before you get to church and as we said we use the pledge system that helps you to do that to think ahead how you would like to do that Paul talked about first Corinthians be intentional give on the first page, set aside, he says, on the first page. Plan it, think about it, make it intentional. Secondly, it is to be proportional. Give as you have received. Churches have traditionally used the 10% amount as a guide for giving. Some years you might be able to give 10%. Some years you might have to give less. Or some years you may begin with one and end with another. You give as you have been given unto the Lord. And then thirdly and finally, our giving is to be generous. Jesus says that God loves a cheerful giver. And as we've been told, the word cheerful is from the word from which we get hilarious. <laughs> so it's okay to laugh at the offertory time. <laughs> laughter, the joys of laughter, laughter and joy. So we give as we have been given. We are rich in Christ who became poor for us. He reigns now as King of Kings and we serve him as his adopted children, as both stewards and disciples. Please stand as we...